Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the professor bit. I quite like that, but I'm not a professor. I'm a lecturer. So, and actually, I'm going to tell you a look, as an introduction because we were asked not to prepare slides, and then we can dig on the the crux of the issue here about jobs and growth, I think, and uh, mobility and intersectoral mobility. Um, I was a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Sheffield. Actually, um, my mobility started from very young uh, because I'm Venezuelan, but I have the double uh, Venezuelan-Italian citizenship. My mom is Italian, so we moved to Italy eventually. I was born in Venezuela, then I did my PhD in France, then I moved from France into an industry in France, and then I decided to go back to research, and then I went back to research with a Marie Curie Fellowship, and then I stayed in the UK, and now I'm a lecturer, and uh, I have a research group. And so I've been flying the Marie Curie flag for a while, and I'm very proud of that, and I always say that I'm very thankful to, for, uh, to the Commission because it really made a difference to my career. I, had, I was lost for science, and that's the truth. Um, I was trapped into a system in a, a country where I had no opportunities for growth, so I had to break free because I was working in a very niche area. I wanted to really learn new techniques that would uh, actually allow me to go a bit more um, to expand and to widen my uh, scientific horizons, and that's when I applied for a Marie Curie Fellowship. Now, um, I have uh, now, well, everything happened, and uh, so my husband and I, because I wasn't alone, so I'm one of those who would like to have it all and have it covered in chocolate, so uh, I, was, uh, I got married, and my husband and I, we moved to the UK, and now we both live in the UK, but we've experienced all the ups and downs of uh, mobility because, of course, he has been very mobile with me. So I know it has been his choice, but I'm not really uh, convinced that it has always been a happy choice. But uh, anyway, we're still together, and we hopefully, until this morning, we were very happily married. So, um, so the, what I want to say, I, I think that the key, um, what I want to say about my presentation, um, about my intervention today, is that um, there, is, there is a problem. Okay, and we can discuss that there is a problem now in Europe. Um, I'm very lucky because I have my lectureship. However, if I were allowed to show you some slides, because I'm a bit like that, to just spend some time, time in the afternoon counting the research jobs that are uh, on jobs.ac.uk. So I decided to do for my discipline a while ago, and the truth was that 80% of those jobs that were advertised were for scientists in short-term contracts um, in various uh, denominations, so PhD studentships, research scientists, research assistants, research uh, associates, uh, scientists, lab technicians, and so on. All of these positions require at least training for a PhD or a PhD. 80% of the positions advertised okay, were for short-term contracts. Then there were about 10% for lectureships in various disciplines, not only mine, and then about five senior positions. So obviously there is a discrepancy between where these PhDs will go, which actually goes very well in line with what Martin was saying before. Academia cannot absorb them all, and that is very good and fine, and actually I encourage my PhD students to think broader. However, the problem is that industry is not following, and now we have a problem. So I would like to discuss this um, a bit further uh, during the discussion, but um, that's uh, basically what this is going to be about. So I'm not, um, I hope I won't be too incendiary, but I am here to say the things that I truly believe I have to say. So I think I'm going to stop here and I will uh, very happily contribute. So thank you very much, Vanessa. Uh, again, questions on this particular contribution? The question of industry engagement is one of particular interest to myself in that I started working in industry and I think I employed one of the first PhD chemists for the Westinghouse Corporation uh, in this particular division of the company. It was actually great concern at his appointment at the time uh, in his first year of operation, he saved his lifetime salary. Questions? Uh, Professor Angelis. Thank you. Vanessa, then you will uh, say uh, from your presentation that the problem in Europe is the industry, the European industry? Well, 
you know, uh, it's very easy just to say I'm an expert on XYZW, so I would only barely qualify as an expert in my own area of expertise. But I say I think that there is a problem. We are producing, and I, Martin said, we are producing many PhD students hoping that there will be some take up because it's part of the European agenda of economy and growth. So we want to become a um, research based society, so highly technologically based. And yes, industry is not picking up. I can give you the example of my husband, who's actually been very mobile with me. He has changed jobs already three times in the last four years. And he was working in one of the hot topic areas, which is um, systems biology. So he used to work in pharma industry. We all know what is going on with pharma industry, which is one of the biggest employers in the EU. There are no jobs. I mean, how many times can you reinvent, reinvent yourself uh, within your career. I mean, how, how many times can you reinvent yourself as a scientist? I mean, it's not like as easy as for Madonna, I would say, because the truth is that we are trained to be very focused. And although he's got many skills and many broad skills, and he has applied his skills in different, so he was in the um, pharma industry, but he also worked for Unilever before, so it wasn't quite pharma, but it was more on the, uh, always in research and development, lipoprotein, metabolism, mathematical modeling, and so on. He's got so many skills that apparently we need, and there are no jobs now. So I would say yes. I, I'm not sure that is the only problem, but definitely it is a problem. Yeah, um, I suggested to Martin that I would say a quick word right now on the outcome of the consultation on a part that very much concerns what Vanessa was talking about. And it, it's indeed a very important issue. And um, just to quote you the, the figures, 68% um, of the respondents feel that researchers are well trained for academia. So about 70% feel they're very well trained for academia. However, this number comes down to about 22% um, finding that researchers are well trained for the business labor market. 65% um, of the respondents believe that it is not easy at all to go from the private into the public sector. But still 60% also believe it's very difficult to go from the public into the private sector. And this, at the moment that we do know, that one of the fundamental difficulties our European economy is confronted with and which hinders us in our economic growth has to do with the <coughs> lower research intensity uh, of the European economy. Six researchers out of 1,000 people in a job versus nine in the US, 11 in Japan. 46% of the researchers are in the business sector compared to 73% in Japan, 80% in the US. It's indeed where the weakness, uh, it's, it's where the weakness is. And so and that, I think, is clearly also ob observed within the uh, responses being given. And also here on one of the position papers, Business Europe, uh, very strongly highlighting the lack of competence uh, in the science, in the engineering, as really holding back uh, economic growth uh, in the European uh, Union level. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, if there are no pressing interactions on this, I'd like to move on to our next speaker, who is Maria Lance Nunez from Eurodoc.